how do you sort of assess like that a technology is worth pursuing? I think always focusing on the at hand and not getting swayed by trends and technology is one of the most important aspects. What do you think the future role of the architect looks like? I think having like a curious side to always investigate new technologies, new tools, new ways of doing things and always the current processes by which you're doing things. I think that's a very important skill to build. How companies like yours look into data ownership in the age of AI. Just educating people about and what really happens when you're dragging and dropping some of those files there mm -hmm. and who's like receiving this data, where it's going, where it's being stored, what it's being used for. I think is a very important thing moving forward to maintain this idea of data ownership. Foster & Partners is one of the largest architectural companies in the world and we were lucky enough to sit down with their applied research team to discuss innovation, AI and tech implementation in architecture. You're listening to Bricks & Bytes and on this episode we welcome Sharif Tarabishi, Associate Partner of their Applied Research and Development Group. In this episode we discuss how Foster & Partners automate their design and fabrication process. Lessons from rolling out custom data interoperability across 45 projects and 2,000 staff and why generative AI can make designers lazier and how you can mitigate this. If you're enjoying our podcast, you can support us by heading over to www.bricksbytes.show and signing up to our newsletter. This is an easy and free way which helps us keep the podcast going. In addition, you'll receive each of the key insights from the guests we have on as well as some bonus content about what's going on in the wider world of construction tech. And now, an announcement from our sponsor, Shift. Worried you'll lag behind because construction's going digital and you struggle with all things tech? You need the right BIM partner to help. That's why this episode is brought to you by Shift, BIM specialist for contractors who want to thrive and stay competitive in construction's digital future. Visit Make the shft.digital for more information. So Sheriff, before we um before before we have people on, we usually put a LinkedIn post out and we are we put like a little bit about the guests coming on for the week and some questions. Um when you shared that post, it got like probably one of the most amount of likes on any post I've ever put out. But no one actually asked a question. Mm -hmm. So you're obviously very liked, but everyone's scared to ask you anything. <laughs> so my conclusion to that is you may be some kind of mafia boss or something. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to say in public, but uh, <laughs> no. Uh, it's an interesting take, actually. Um, but also, like, most of the people who are following me are people I work with or students in the university. And um, I, re I already participate in a lot of uh, talks and conferences and so on. So... Yeah, I think if, if someone had a question to ask me, they already had a lot of opportunities to ask. Mm. Uh, yeah. Ralph questions. So with that, Sheriff, um, yeah, give us a little bit about um, who you are and, and kind of where you came from. Um, so I started uh, back in Egypt in Cairo. I studied uh, architecture engineering and environmental design. Actually, I, I started first ele electronics engineering mm -hmm. before I decided to switch. Mm. What made you switch? I got a little bit bored of the amount of physics and maths mm -hmm. that I was studying. Little did I know that I would be using that All maths time. now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it, it was an interesting switch. Um, then after I finished my uh, bachelor there, I worked for a while in uh, an architecture studio. Um, and then I opened a consultancy with one of my tutors uh, in the university, a digital consultancy for um, showing people how to integrate different technologies within their design to production workflows. Um, Which year was it? That was around um, 2012. Mm -hmm. 2013 maybe and it was one of such consultancies one of the first in in egypt um it was an interesting uh time back there um obviously 
we worked for quite a while, but the market wasn't really ripe for this kind of um, interventions. Mm-hmm. Too early. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, now also I see a difference between like how things are working here and there and why here there is a lot of interest in integrating technology for profit margins of projects that might be very little compared mm-hmm. to Egypt where mm-hmm. materials and labor might be extremely cheap and already contractors have very big profit margins so there is very little interest in changing how things are done yeah. mm. so there is no driving force to make things better no, in the market mm-hmm. um, here's the other way around actually right here the profit margins are uh, low mm-hmm. to a point that there is very big interest and money lying around to put in any technological advancements that would make you squeeze any efficiency out of your process um yeah so that was an interesting realization after i came here Mm -hmm. um i moved here to do my masters in architecture computation um and then i started working in the applied r d team in foster and partners Mm -hmm. And now you're an associate partner and you're also a visiting lecturer at Bartlett School of Architecture. So it's been some kind of journey all the way from Egypt to yep. to where you yep. are now. Yeah, how was it transitioning from uh, perhaps like um, um, traditional architecture to to like um, more computational? It, do you need like a certain kind of uh, brain type to be able to do that? Because one in my head is a bit more like create, not creative, but crafty, whereas the others is a bit more kind of uh, technical and bit more program programmatic is that a word i'm not sure i believe anyone can do it i had interest in that area since my uh, bachelor like back in uh, 2010 2009 maybe uh, during summer i was participating with a friend of mine in an architecture competition and um, they had a requirement to do something with the facade of the building that we're designing and they were like hey we've been seeing uh those kind of techniques and those kind of workflows using uh, scripting. Can you have a look at this and let us know how we can integrate it in what we're doing? Um, so I started like studying on my own. There wasn't really many uh, opportunities uh, or resources available on- online for this. Hmm. Um, I helped them do the implementation and the competition. Um, and since then, I was very interested in this area. Um, And directly after I finished my uh, bachelor there, I also started teaching in the university um, and introduced those courses uh, for introducing different scripting techniques and different technologies in the design workflow. Mm -hmm. And that was like uh, uh, scripting techniques, you mean coding? Uh, yeah, whether coding or uh, visual or node-based coding like Grasshopper in uh, Rhino. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there a difference between uh, designing? I mean, obviously there is, but is there like a different way you approach things when you're designing things in somewhere like Egypt versus, uh, um, well, I, I assume that you're working on projects in London, but Foster and Partners, where you work as a global uh, a pr- a company. So, um, my, my experience lots of people in Egypt design overseas. Uh, yes. Uh, a lot of the projects I worked on while I was in Egypt were. Uh, projects for the MENA re- region in general. Yes. Um, very few were international. Um, but yeah, I don't think I saw a big jump in mentality or in process. Um, I think once I came here, I, I fit in pretty well and fast within the team. And I think when you look at it from the point of view of the problems that they're, you're trying to solve, you just have different inputs or different parameters that you might need to consider. But at the end of the day, the process is pretty much the same. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I didn't feel a big jump or a big change. You're still trying to get from A to B, right? Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, applied research at Foster and Partners, what does that mean? How does your day look like? Um, usually very busy. Uh, so in, in Foster and Partners, the the way the office is structured is very interesting. We have uh, six design studios and we have around 13 or 14 specialist teams or support teams that act as in-house consultants for those design studios. Um, uh, specialists like uh, 
landscape design team, urban design team, uh, structure engineering team, uh, and applied R&D is one of those teams. Historically, um, we've always been around 1% of the size of the company. Uh, the company now is around 2,000 people, um, and we're uh, actually inching a little bit higher than 1% now, we're mm -hmm. 24. No, nice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> two and two. Yeah. <laughs> And um, the the um, like we work under uh, three categories in a sense. Um, part of it is offering design support uh, for the design teams when it comes to uh, geometry optimization, uh, um, detail extraction for fabrication, um, a, a, a lot of those aspects that we work in. I'll tell you a little bit about the. Uh, six core capabilities that we do. Um, and then another aspect is uh, more related to developing tools. So from a lot of our interactions with the design team, sometimes we find that they are facing the same problems over mm -hmm. and over again. Mm -hmm. And this is when we start formalizing the solution in a sense in a product that we can develop, deploy across the company, maintain and train people on so that they can use it on their own. And that's like another um, category of work that we do. And then the third is more uh, research based, uh, which usually there is a strategy for the whole team where we want to go, mm -hmm. but it's also um, bottom up driven a bit based on the interests of the different people in the team. Um, across the team, we have people from different backgrounds with different interests, but the common thread between all of us is that we're all programmers. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and interested in solving problems. Mm -hmm. Not um, necessarily architects or engineers? like uh, uh, We have architects, we have structure engineers, we have artists. Um, wow. Yeah, so it's a pretty mixed mm -hmm. bunch. Um, Andy Warhol. Hmm? Andy Warhol, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of the six areas of uh, research that we're interested in working in, um, one of them is uh, machine learning and uh, data science and data wrangling. Another aspect is um, uh, geometry optimization for fabrication, um, high performance computing, uh, XR and VR, um, and collaborative tools uh, that the designers use uh, during their design process. Uh, so those are like six umbrellas that mm. most of our products or our research work under. That's a lot. So on the fabrication um, kind of working, um, do you basically work on like, architects come up with like a very fancy curves and shapes and then you have them achieve them uh, within the software so then they can come to for fabrication or exactly it, it depends um, when this happens across the design process it mm -hmm. might be early stage and they know that okay to fabricate this it might be very expensive so we need to rationalize it somehow mm. or optimize it depending on whether we know at this point in time what is the fabrication process that we're going to use. Mm -hmm. um, or if it's in a later stage, then a lot of things might have already been um, known about the project, the fabrication technique, all of those things, and we might be optimizing uh, things in terms of cost, for example, or in terms of uh, making the fabrication more streamlined. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's basically taking different constraints, whether from the designers, from the client, or from other uh, stakeholders, like the fabricator, for example, and using those constraints to optimize or tweak the geometry uh, to make it perform better. Makes sense. Okay, so these tools you're developing, they, they, they sound, this sounds to me, from what I understand, is that they're mostly uh, for internal use. So one thing we try and explore on this podcast is, is kind of like uh, use cases for technology that has been um, developed but usually it's technology that is developed by a startup or someone and they're selling into a company like Foster and Partners or whoever else. So if Foster and Partners are creating this software, there's actually a use case because you're using it internally, then why is this software not uh, made available to the to the wider market and perhaps not sold, but I don't know. I mean, one, one aspect of it is definitely IP, right? Like mm -hmm. any piece of development that we create in-house is part of what makes Foster and Partners Foster and Partners. Mm -hmm. um, and in a market that is based on competition, mm -hmm. any edge that you have yeah. is uh, something that gives you an edge in the market, basically. Um, 
there are um, those discussions are um, happening internally, and a lot of people are interested in exploring the possibilities of what could happen if some of those tools might be um, opened up for yeah. the market. Uh, it's an ongoing process that we're exploring. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I just like it's some people we had on the podcast are advocates for open innovation. So it's like uh, everyone should just share a thing in the industry. We've moved together collectively, but I totally also understand the comp the, the competition element. Like it makes sense. We're in business. Like right? a dreamland kind of, right? Because yep. yeah, communism. And I mean, also personally, I believe any piece of, especially if we're speaking about software, any piece of software that we put in the public domain comes with a responsibility. Uh, and whether we want to take on that responsibility to not just be supporting our in-house projects, but also supporting all users who are interested in using this tool is mm. not an easy task to... Mm. Of course. To yeah. It's like a separate them. business, right? Yeah. You need yeah. to mm -hmm. have support and people who will babysit those who are yep. using it as to there are, right? So I think if you want to stay a great, ar great architect, you just stay a great architect. <laughs> yes, <laughs> true. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of the... Um, Again, given the type of projects that we do in Foster and Partners, there are a lot of bespoke things that mm -hmm. happen in each single project. And it's not necessarily that a lot of the tools that we develop might be usable for um, any other types of offices that work in different typologies of projects. Um, so I think it's also good like to keep in mind this aspect that it's not necessarily that we create a tool internally, that there will be uh, a use for it in the wide market, the wider market. Mm -hmm. What about, um, is there an area within design stack that should be developed and explored more, broadly speaking, that it's not explored enough right now, or maybe within foster partners or generally? Personally, I think the design aspect is explored a lot and there might be a lot of inefficiencies around running a design business that might be mm -hmm. more interesting to explore what would that be for example um i mean if you go to any office and map the different processes that they are doing aside from the design mm -hmm. work mm -hmm. there is a lot happening there to mm -hmm. make the business a business yeah and also at the same time, it's something that you don't get taught in architecture school how to mm -hmm. run a design or in general in uh, any creative led uh, industry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, very few schools actually teach the business uh, side of things. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, I think uh, like across those processes, there are a lot of uh, interest mm -hmm. to do things so opportunities yeah. is in the workflow you say yeah? yeah could you give us an example uh sheriff of um one technology that you have developed internally and i think we were discussing before we started this about uh, a software that came to our attention recently called speckle or even rayon where it, it, it allows a completely collaborative environment so everyone's working on a single file as opposed to what is deemed as the standard where it's like one file architect does their bit, sends it to the engineer, engineer does their bit, and it's just very clunky and nothing's really happening in real time. So yeah, you could, could you talk about uh, Yeah. So Hermes is one of the in-house tools that we've been working on for uh, years now. Um, and it was basically that we identified a problem, like you're saying, the interoperability of data between different software that is usually used by different stakeholders in the project. Um, and to try and fix that, we uh, created Hermes, which is um, a message passing software that is living in the cloud and can communicate messages or transform messages from one software to Hermes uh, language, let's mm -hmm. say. Um, is it Greek or? Greek, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, for example, um, in a recent project that we're working on, uh, we identified that um, specific people within the team are going to be dealing with the grid lines from the project. So this team can say, I want to control the grid lines while I'm working in Revit. And whenever I finish using Hermes, I will publish to anyone interested that I updated my grid. 
So someone who's creating the facade in Rhino or in Grasshopper and they build their own workflow based on the input of the grid lines, whenever a new message is available, they're able to pick it up and run that workflow in an automated way mm -hmm. and nice. get the results back. So on this, uh, if I can go a little bit further, because yeah, yeah. it does it not generate like lots of notes that needs to be, that someone has to go through and to pick up these messages? Because of course, which is usually like the files that get scattered around yeah. your file system. Uh, but now it's versioned and controlled on the cloud. You know who authored it. You know the sequence by which mm -hmm. things were pushed to the public mm -hmm. or to the different stakeholders to build on. Mm -hmm. And you can also build your workflows on specific parts of it. Mm -hmm. So for example, after I create the facade in Rhino and I publish to everyone, hey, the facade is ready. Mm -hmm. If we have the environmental engineering team interested in running analyses, but on a simplified version of the geometry, not the heavy one, mm -hmm. they can query that from my last message and automatically run their workflow and create reports based on my latest version of the facade. Yeah, what I'm just thinking is like, because currently there's something similar that uh, I came across and there's like lots of notes. And the question is a designer can get lost within all of this. So there will be, I think it will be very intuitive to have I don't know how to phrase it really, but the latest up-to-date kind of information which summarizes everything above and just brings it down to like what is the, the latest. But I mean, that is always happening, right? Because mm. uh, I can query the data from a specific task or a specific workflow and I can always get the latest. But also in terms of auditing uh, previous data, I can still do that. Mm -hmm. I can still go and see in the submission that we did in 15th of March, mm -hmm. uh, which messages were we using back then? And can I reconstruct how the project looked at during that time? And I should be able to do that very easily. Mm -hmm. Okay. What technology excites you the most? Um, I would say with the whole hype that is happening now around uh, machine learning, there are a lot of aspects of it that excites me. Um, of course, like finding interesting domain applications, but also personally looking at um, people around us and how they are perceiving that technology and how they are uh, using it to build things. Mm. Um, I mean, we don't really in in our generation get the opportunity that much to see such a massive adoption to a technology and be uh, part of it. Mm. Um, one aspect I've been interested about machine learning is the idea of intent and how it affects the intent of designers mm -hmm. or creative people in general. Um, if you look back in history to the different tools that we had and you try and plot um, the progression of someone's skill versus their frustration mm -hmm. while they are trying to deliver the intent that yeah. they have in their mind. Mm -hmm. As their skills get better, yeah. their frustration gets less, yeah. but mm -hmm. they're also closer to the initial intent that they had in their mind. Mm -hmm. While with the introduction of AI, AI and specifically like the generative yes. based AI, suddenly now you have like a very uh, steady line between uh, skills and frustration. Regardless to your skills, you're able to generate something, but is it your initial intent or not? Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that all the products that are coming out of the tool are polished in a sense, mm -hmm. you can imagine how suddenly people can become just lazy and accepting to whatever it's creating. And like another interesting thing here to mm -hmm. highlight as well um, is that frustration that happens, it usually creates this idea of cognitive dissonance, like you have something in your mind, you, you have something in front of you, and they don't align. Yeah. And this usually either leads to frustration or sometimes motivation. Mm -hmm. And this is usually when interesting things happen. 
like I would go and try a different medium. I would go and try a different technology. I would go and rephrase what the problem is or what I have in my mind. And I think the idea that suddenly we have a tool that minimizes the frustration, but not by making it easier for you to get what in your mind out, but rather just giving you something directly on the plate, mm -hmm. would be very interesting moving forward in the kind of data and artifacts that we generate in general. Um, I've used a few times the GPTs to generate some images for a house I was designing. Uh, and it just, every time I generated an image, it was completely different. Yeah, so completely and it different. Looked fine. It looked fine, but it was completely something different than I was expecting. And I was just, I think I was thinking that I'm phrasing in the same way, added something. It was just completely different building. So I think it's a long journey, at least for those uh, general GPTs to kind of get it, get it uh, right. Or per perhaps I was making a mistake. Putting so, so so we had an interesting installation in the recent open house that we had in the office where we were showing people um, an image of a foster and partners building, um, asking them to try and describe what they are seeing as if this is the idea that they have in mm. their mind. And then looking, like evaluating objectively how close is the generated image to the image that we were showing them. I mean, again, it's not like a, a, a scientific study. Yeah. But you can imagine yeah. in, a, in, a, in a context where you're stressed to deliver something, how faster you would be to just completely miss whatever you have in your mind and yeah. accept the polished thing and completely. So, so what you're saying is you have an intention, you put it through the GPT thing, and the thing that comes out the other side might not be actually what you intended, but you just accept it because you're like, that's your you, yeah. something's changed in your mind between and, that and, and and previously like the frustration that you would have would most of the time if you're a creative person would be the motivation to explore a lot of different things and this variability is what the current models are building on right? mm -hmm. so also another aspect you would imagine Do you mean on randomness yeah the 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 variability of expression mm -hmm. if everything that we were feeding the models looked the same. Mm -hmm. The models that we're using mm. now for generative uh, image generation mm. wouldn't be as exciting as they yeah. are. Interesting. And, and again, if you take it up a notch, you can imagine in the future that um, like just like we have the first prototypes of cameras as artifacts in museums, you can imagine that it's not the models of today or the models that we're going to create in the future that will be worthy of putting in museums. It will rather be the pure data sets. Hey guys, just a quick announcement. Throughout April, we're giving away a free sponsorship. This is a way for you to get in front of a highly niche and targeted audience. It will include podcast ads, social media ads, and newsletter ads. Visit our website, www bricksbytes.show that's www.bricksbytes.show and hit the red button in the header to enter good luck that we collected before the point in time yeah. that those models started just generating yeah, 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 stuff yeah. In oh wow okay this is getting quite deep <laughs> <laughs> i would pre personally i would prefer for generative ai to give me exactly what i'm thinking about so i can then validate my thesis or do something with with what I'm thinking about. But do you really know what you're thinking about? I do know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is an interesting like uh, I UX. think it's iteration, right? We want to yes. iterate. We want the AI to all, uh, um, give us like faster, better iteration, right? So we can look at the details and tweak it and get some result very, very quickly. Next, the next, the next one closer, the next one closer, right? But when I get interesting UX experiment yes. that we can do yeah. like where we can get some people and have them using those kind of models mm. versus models that instead of giving you a very polished image, mm -hmm. gives you a little bit of defined noise. Mm -hmm. And as you iterate over it, mm -hmm. it will start getting closer to a final polished image, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it got in a sense the direction from you of what you want it yeah. to be. Yes. Right. Yeah, I would love to dive into that deeper, but we have some things to get through. In Foster in, in Foster and Partner, how hard is it to implement new technology? Obviously, a big company, two thousand people. Like, it's not going to be as quick as like a 
say five to ten employee company so is there a process that you guys follow um i mean for creating uh, minimal viable products which is something that we constantly do within our team it's uh, pretty straightforward once we find a need once we identify a potential solution that we think might work we get people working on it and create an mvp um, if this is something we're using um, like for one project that's it because we can directly use it there and produce a result out of it if it's something that we see might be beneficial for more people then the process becomes a little bit different where we have to consider a lot of uh, aspects, security, IP, uh, legal aspects, uh, before we can deploy uh, such a technology or such a product on uh, wider teams. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, and how, how do you sort of assess like um, that a technology is worth pursuing? Does it say, like, we've had 50 people ask for this now, we need to do it, or is it like, this might be cool, let's try it? Like, is there a kind of uh, I strategy? Think I think always focusing on the problem at hand and not getting swayed by uh, trends in technology is one of the most important aspects. Like keeping the the problem as your uh, friend, yes, yeah. as, as your guide. Yeah, it makes you look at things in a very strategic way versus a lot of people who. Um, use technology for the sake of using technology mm -hmm. um, and in that case you will find yourself like just following trends right mm. um, yeah. yeah yeah from from design point of view uh, like from maybe 10,000 feet view what companies like yours struggle with from design point of view from a design point of view yeah I think with the current tools that we have in the market interoperability is definitely one of the biggest hurdles mm -hmm. um, customization of tools um, is Hermes internally solving the interoperability of yes the uh, we've been using Hermes in around 45 uh, projects I big thought you said years oh my god <laughs> <laughs> uh, 45 big projects mm -hmm. um, yeah and, and like having access to the code base and being able to tweak it as we go along based on the problems that the project is facing has been a um, a very nice thing to have. I think also the, the idea of easily scaling up the tools based on the size of the projects that you're working on. Mm -hmm. um, the fact like the current way of software delivery limits you mm -hmm. in that. Um, and I think in the future tools that would allow you to scale up however you want in an easy manner are the ones people are going to lean towards more mm -hmm. what about uh, retention of knowledge so if you have an employee who's been with the company for 30 years they are uh, absolutely brilliant what they do they've done deliver ton of projects but they're leaving or they're moving on right and how how does company like yours retain this knowledge somehow or how can you think about retaining this knowledge in the future if there's no tools right now for example like what, what is the approach to that because no one wants it within their business to suddenly lose this pillar of a vertical within the business um there are a lot of ways to tackle this um couple that we've been working on one of them is uh, recently with the rise of large language models we've been working on uh, something we're calling uh, FMP Ask which is mm -hmm. basically a web app that allows different um, specialist teams within the office to contribute their knowledge bases so we have a team like the technical design team who for 40 years has been curating different documents about our design guidelines mm -hmm. uh, what materials to use when uh, depending on the typology of the project the location of the project can you send me pdf no <laughs> <laughs> i'm i'm quite i'm quite upset that you called it ask F, was it ask fmp you didn't call it after a, a name of someone like uh, <laughs> barry or, or uh we actually Claude. had uh, initially Claude. we had uh, like an internal name uh, called arthur uh yeah who was uh, um, uh, 
uh, one of the leads in the specifications team and was uh, like the go-to person yeah. when it came <laughs> to uh, yeah as um, his relic mm-hmm. yes um so with the um, with the tool now those specialist teams are able to contribute those documents and historically those documents were very dense so people weren't really like they were yeah. still billing the teams for hours to uh, answer the same questions over and over again mm-hmm. Um, so now using those documents with FP ask, like the people are able to ask questions, get the results back, get the pages, the results appeared and be able to navigate directly to them. But also we've been looking on the um, trust side. How can we build trust between mm-hmm. the designers, the expert team and the algorithms or the machine learning models that we're deploying? Mm-hmm. Um, so we implemented like a, a review feature where it's like a human in the loop uh, process mm-hmm. where at any point someone asks a question that uses uh, some documents that you own contributed. For example, you will get a notification telling you, hey, someone asked a question that used your documents. Can you please verify it? Mm. So you're still able to stay in the loop but asynchronously freeing your time to do other stuff while still building trust with the users that the data is being verified. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's one thing, for example. Another tool that we've been working on uh, with collaboration with um, our management group and uh, commercial group is looking at um, different fee proposals that we're issuing for uh, projects and being able to build predictive models uh, that can help them minimize risk uh, from the fee proposal to the time that the project is delivered. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, you can imagine something like this. It was always um, specific to, like it was an easy task for people who have been in the office for a long time. Mm -hmm. They would be very easily they would know what to do in terms of the structure of the fees. But for example, when you start onboarding people Mm -hmm. uh, and the idea of finding the right comparable projects historically Mm -hmm. uh, and where should we get that from? So the whole product is built on bubbling up the right information for those new people in the team to be able to take an informed decision um, at the right time. Makes sense. What do you think the um, the uh, future role of the architect looks like? And maybe if you were a uni student right now, what would you? Uh, where would you be putting your uh, focus time on? Move on to finance. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think more technology oriented, but not necessarily enamored by it. Um, I think having like a um, a curious side to always investigate new technologies, new tools, new ways of doing things and always questioning the current processes by which you're doing things. I think that's a very important skill to build while you're in university. How exactly will an architect role look like? We will no see. one knows. Yeah. No. We don't know what we don't know. You're right. <laughs> it's Martin's favorite saying. Yes. <laughs> so you previously were describing this tool that you have, um, this AI tool that is kind of uh, gathering the knowledge, right? So I'm just curious, like, is it at the design stage? So is it in the, within the software? Like when you're trying to design something, then it's just popping out and telling you this information about what you're trying to do? Or is it, is it not within the software layer? somewhere like a notepad kind of place that you you have and you have these notes because i feel like it will be very useful obviously i don't have i don't know what you guys like working on there but it will be very very useful to have something during the design when you're trying to design something there is kind of something intelligently coming up and saying oh someone tried to did something similar and that's how they did it some prompt etc towards that right? Right now, it's not on the software level of mm-hmm. what the designers are using. It's like a separate separate thing. 
scratch pad, let's say, on the right, yeah. where you're able to ask questions and get the answers back. Mm -hmm. But I see it developing in the future towards what you're saying. But for this to happen, mm -hmm. I think we need to look at how a lot of the data that we're creating is being collected. Because you must have, yeah, you must have like at least 20 years of like IF IFC files, kind of, right? Right. So then if you can gather this in one thing, obviously do some AI on it. <laughs> Push a button. And it, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Done. and then make it work. Yeah. Easy. Easy. Yeah. <laughs> it is, right? Yeah. Just GPT. <laughs> GPT. <laughs> um, I yeah, so it, the question is really like, how do you approach um, machine learning and gathering the data um, towards the future projects? And how can you, what can you, how can you aggregate the data that you already have for the last 20, 55 years? I mean, the, the data already exists and every day we're generating way more. Mm. And I think an interesting approach that we're taking is to try and map uh, different processes within the office that we find uh, interesting or can have um, a better way of being done look at the data that they are generating or they require to ingest in order to do that process and look at how we can from now moving forward mm -hmm. record it in a way that is usable for us yeah um once we see in that process that our mvp makes sense it's a valid use case mm -hmm. it's actually useful for people within the office makes them more efficient, makes them uh, like take more informed decisions. That's when we start looking at the historical data. Mm -hmm. I think also like um, we're just discussing before uh, we came here that in the past couple of years, there's been a lot of hype about um, data mm -hmm. and data roles across organizations. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of money being poured to do um, like holistic sweeps of how all our data should be structured, which a lot of times doesn't really lead to something of use, something like uh, a good return on investment that mm -hmm. you put in. And I think the better approach is the approach that we're currently taking, where you start incrementally finding the, the workflows that might be um, pressing mm -hmm. to completely shift or transform, mm -hmm. look at the data required by them and incrementally solve this issue before looking at the 55 years of historical data. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, what excites me when I think about it, when you speak about it is uh, imagine, and as an architect, you get excited that whatever work you do today, tomorrow, next week, next month, it will be aggregated towards some intelligent data which will be which will be like increasing the value proposition of the company really because it is intelligence which will be kept not within a human but within within the database yep and and making your day-to-day -day work as well easier easier and more enjoyable mm -hmm. i just wanted to ask one question i watched a video um of uh foster and partners before i came and there was this um robot called spot the dog on there um I'm yet to see a spot the dog on any construction site. So have you seen it on a site before? And actually the video, it was on a construction site, but there was no one working. Um, I mean, there are, there were pretty, because we were using uh, Spot as part of the early adopters program. We were lucky to be one of the first architecture companies in the world to be part of that program. Um, and the idea was to find interesting use cases um, using this technology. Um, and the project that we were working on was basically looking at construction monitoring and how we can close the loop and automating the whole process um, in terms of data capture on site, uh, regularly comparing it uh, to design intent represented in a BIM model and generating automated reports to go to different stakeholders to take actions on. Um, and given that it was the early model there were very strict guidelines in terms of 
uh, space that we need to uh, keep around it. And of course, you know, in a construction site, seeing something like this, everyone was uh, crazy, like to take selfies and so on. <laughs> and I think this will keep happening until it becomes a reality in the construction site. It's not something that's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, but it's definitely something that's going to happen in the near future. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Data ownership, uh, how companies like yours look into data ownership in the age of AI? I think this is definitely a very important hot topic um, in terms of uh, not just the data that, again, historical data and like the IP it represents, uh, but also current data and educating everyone within the office uh, about the current use of AI tools and how by uh, submitting something on uh, open source tools or cloud hosted tools, you might be breaking that mm -hmm. uh, without really knowing. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is going to decrease the speed of adoption of these platforms, right? Um, I don't believe so, at least in our office, because we've been working on developing uh, different applications that are hosted on-premises within our own infrastructure, uh, screened by our legal team and our IT to make sure that our confidential project data mm -hmm. is maintained and no one is breaching that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the um, one of the interesting aspects about the current tries of machine learning and AI is that the model of software delivery is now completely different. Before you had to go through IT, uh, if you had a setup in a big enterprise to whitelist a specific EXE that you need to install, <laughs> while now everything is running on the cloud through APIs, um, you don't really need to install anything. It's one click away and you're just dragging and dropping whatever data that you're using mm -hmm. uh, for the provider to consume. And just educating people about this difference and what really happens when you're dragging and dropping some of those files there mm -hmm. and who's like receiving this data, where it's going, where it's being stored, what it's being used for, I think is a very important thing moving forward to maintain this idea of data ownership. Sharif, so when people can find out more about you and Foster Partners? Um, when? Where? If I said when? <laughs> Tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so when and where? <laughs> Obviously um, where. My LinkedIn page. Uh, we also have uh, the Foster and Partners website, and we have the Applied R and D uh, page mm -hmm. on the website. It's a great page, by the way, um, where we always post about the recent things that we're working on. Mm -hmm. And you're based in Battersea by the river. We're based in Battersea by the river. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sheriff. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. <laughs>